Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Buna William uh, from Michigan, the largest uh, Arabic population in America, whether you like it or not. And we get along together. It's wonderful. A lot of uh, diaspora people there. And we have wonderful restaurants, wonderful culture, wonderful expression of the uh, Arabic. And I have to also mention Chaldeans because there's a couple hundred thousand of them and, uh, and they don't consider themselves Arabic. So I'm always corrected when I when I mention to include them as well, wonderful people. And um, we get along, and that's a very important thing because we're here to talk about interfaith, and that means getting along uh, under God, in, in, in the sight of God. God loves us all equally and wants us to love each other, and we're called to do that. I'm proud to uh, have today to speak to you. Uh, first of all, Bishop Richard Graham, who is... Uh, um, Bishop of the Metropolitan Washington, D.C., uh, Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. And uh, he's also a pastor in College Park, Maryland. And he uh, is here to speak to you from uh, his perspective uh, in unity with us. Also, um, we have, uh, again, if you were here last night, remember Iman Hendi. He is the founder and president of the Clergy Beyond Borders. Um, Muslim chaplain of Georgetown University, where he teaches a course on religious to uh, understanding and, and tolerance. He has a PhD in com uh, com comparative religions, uh, and uh, he's an expert, as we all should become, in conflict resolution. And so uh, I welcome, there was supposed to be a rabbi here, I'm not sure if he's arriving yet. I'll introduce him if he comes in. And uh, so I'd like to begin by asking Bishop Graham to address us uh, from his perspective. Thank you very much. I have uh, a few remarks of a sort of general nature before we get to the, the main business at hand. <clears throat> and my general remarks are about interfaith dialogue as I have experienced it as, as a parish pastor and as a neighbor and as a person who just lives in a, in a busy, diverse community in the Washington, D.C. area. One of the things that interfaith dialogue in general reveals, I think, is the stunning ignorance that most of us have about other people's religion. The, the stereotypical things that we believe about other people's faith would just be embarrassing if they touched on any other subject. But we have allowed ourselves, at least in, in this country, to be fairly ignorant about, about other people's religion and about other people's religious practice. The other even more amazing thing to me that a person learns from interfaith dialogue is how ignorant people are of their own religious traditions. It's often apparent in, in interfaith conversation, for instance, that almost any Jewish person knows more about the New Testament than many, many Christians. And that lots and lots of people in Islam have had, for various reasons, the need and the opportunity to study Christianity much more deeply than many Christians have ever bothered to do. One of the things that interfaith dialogues do, again, whether they are academic, whether they are cultural or political, whether they are just conversations you have with your neighbors, one of the things they do is give each of us an opportunity to learn more about our own faith in the context of our conversation with our friends and our neighbors. That's something that, um, that we don't often allow for, I think, but all of the learning is, is shared in an interfaith dialogue. Nobody is just a teacher and nobody is just a student. We're learners together. All of that said, Interfaith dialogue in the Holy Land seems to me to provide a special case of what I'm talking about. Lots and lots of the interfaith dialogue that I personally have been exposed to and been part of involves people from other parts of the world flying over there to take, place, to take part in conversations which are supposed to be informative and helpful and which tend to ignore almost altogether the facts on the ground, so to speak. There's a famous case in the Lutheran community of someone, a very prominent Lutheran broadcaster, who went to have an interfaith dialogue in, in Bethlehem with um, a Jewish rabbi who had flown in from Germany. 
and they talked f to each other for several days. They made several hours of videotape, and they never went to the Lutheran church in Bethlehem. They were right down the street, and the Lutherans have been there a long time, but it never occurred to them that there would be anything on the, on the ground there that would be nearly as interesting as their conversation with each other from, from other parts of the world. There's been reference made here already, especially in the conversations around business environments in the Holy Land, about the way in which interfaith dialogue has to take place in places where people have to work together. That's the real, in my opinion, the real kind of dialogue, the dialogue that takes place when people are trying to accomplish common tasks, when they're trying to work together to do something fairly simple, earn a living. It seems to me that that's, again, something that we should, should emphasize and should, should Rabbi? Yes, yes, good. It has to be kosher. And without the rabbi, it's not kosher. But <laughs> halal. Halal, yeah. <laughs> well, let, let, me just, let me just finish up then. The, um, the, the, uh, the, the dialogues that are, are, are engaged in in the Holy Land are really matters of life and death there. People need to be able to live at peace with their neighbors. They need to be able to live at peace with their coworkers, and they need to be able to share in their dreams and their aspirations. But it seems to me, honestly, that interfaith dialogue is also a matter of life and death everywhere in the world today. It is certainly a matter of life and death in North America. You don't have to think much past the bombings in Boston to realize the way in which different people's religious understandings in that city, that city which prides itself on being the home of freedom and open-mindedness and every good thing. You don't have to think about that very long to realize interfaith communities there don't engage, faith communities there did not seem to engage with each other very helpfully. And that what leads me to say just this observation, that interfaith dialogue is something that all of us should be involved in. You shouldn't leave it to the clergy. You shouldn't leave it to the experts. You shouldn't leave it to the people who make a living at it. You should take it up yourself. It is almost certain that you have friends or neighbors. You have people you work with who share a different religious tradition than you do. Ask them about it. Make that part of what you do to get to know the people around you. Interfaith dialogue is just as important here as it is any place else. So with that general introduction, then I will pass on. Before I uh, ask uh, Imam Hundi to speak to us, uh, I'd like to welcome officially Rabbi Gerald Sarota, who is Executive Director of Clergy Beyond the Borders. And uh, Dr. Uh, Sarota is with us today as, again, uh, a man who seeks uh, solution to conflict in the Middle East. He's a rabbi in Maryland, Chevy Chase, and he holds his doctorate from uh, Hebrew Union College. Welcome, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. I love freedom. I do not like freedom. Cheers. That's be, like my God. Too, too limiting. <laughs> My friends, uh, it's an honor to be back again to this wonderful conference. I congratulate you uh, for your commitment to peace in the Middle East and for being here. I know you could be doing some other things around DC. There's so many wonderful things to see. Uh, I start with a joke uh, of a very well known Arab character. Arabs here know him, Joha. Joha once went uh, to a place uh, to speak and he asked the audience, do you know what I was, what I'm going to talk about? And the answer was, no. He said, well, if you don't know, why should I bother? And he left. <laughs> they went after him, please, please, Juha, come back, talk to us, we need you. He came back and said, again, do you know what I was going to talk about? And they said, yes. He said, well, if you know, why should I speak? And he left. <laughs> My God, now they had to really have the man come back and speak. They played a trick on him. They went after him. They brought him back, and he asked, do you know what I am going to talk about? 
So 50% of the audience said yes, and 50% said no. He said, that's very simple. Those who know, tell those who don't know. <laughs> and left. So I could do that. <laughs> because many of you do already know about this uh, conflict in that beautiful piece of land. Do you know about uh, what is going on? And I believe you know what is the way of moving forward uh, with, with, with that region. Interreligious dialogue is real, is needed. It is, a, I believe, a religious demand. I believe God demands that we come to the table of dialogue. I always make the joke how in the Quran, like in other scriptures, God is in dialogue with the devil at one point. And Abraham is in dialogue with his people, and Moses is in dialogue with his people, and Jesus is in dialogue with his people, whether they like those who liked him, those who did not like him. At the end of the day, we need dialogue. We need to master the ability to talk and the ability to listen. And that is what lacks in that piece of land. Our ability to uh, present ourselves with passion, but with honesty, and our ability to listen and master the art of listening. A few things I want to discuss with you. Number one, uh, we are standing against fear of the other, and you fear that which you do not know. We are standing against ignorance of the other. How many Jews here know about the Christianity from within? And how many Christians know about Islam? How many Muslims know about Judaism? and about the Christianity from within, not the from without. Fox News, my friends, don't go to it. It does not even have the basics of religion 101, let alone more you know, deep discussions on these religions. You know, the ability to go out of your way to jump in and learn. 25 years ago, having moved to America from Palestine, it was my own choice to take a Greyhound bus from Austin, Texas, to end up in Hartford, Connecticut at a Christian seminary and became the first Muslim to attend that Christian seminary to study the Bible from within. I said, Christians, I give myself to you. Witness to me. Tell me who Jesus is, what the Bible is, and let me learn. And it was the best experience ever for me to discover that the Bible is not the book of the other. Actually, it could be my own book too. And within the Bible, I found so many wonderful things to help me grow in my own faith, grow in my own religiosity, grow in my own moral ethics, uh, uh, political ethics, social ethics, personal ethics. So I don't read the Bible like I'm reading their book. It's my book too. Enough for me now to be invited often to deliver homilies in the Christian services. I will be doing one next Sunday in Cumberland. And a few weeks ago, I did the homily at uh, an Episcopal church at the cathedral in Harrisburg. Great, you should have, were you there? Oh, great, so wonderful. And I was there, I, you know, you were there, I was at home. I did not feel I was a preaching to the other. And I hope, and I don't think they felt, felt I was a stranger. I was really at home in that beautiful church, often get invited to deliver homilies in synagogues. And that's what I did for my PhD work. I went into Jewish studies and told Jews, you teach me who you are and who you are not. This is what we all need. I'm not bragging about myself, but it's a story that have, has come alive from the willingness and the commitment to change. How often can we do that? And do we do that? Do we need to do that? Yes, we do. So we are strongly standing against fear of the other, ignorance of the other, prejudice against the other, and hate of the other. Hate the other because of who they are, or because of who we are, or because sometimes the only way to feel good about myself is to demonize you. The only way to feel good about the Christianity is to make Muslims and Jews feel outside. And Christians do, some Christians do that. Some Muslims do that too. Some Jews do that too. We recently did a program at Georgetown University called Challenging texts, the doomed, the saved, and the chosen. It was a wonderful discussion coming together to study these problematic texts. Who is who and who is what, and how can we bring in 
and embrace the people instead of rejecting and undermining. My second point is, uh, uh, um, if we believe that we are equally created in the image of God, we have to be ready for radical equalizing of all people as God's children. I'm going to say that again. If we believe that we are equally created in the image of God, we have to be ready for radical equalizing of all people as God's children. And that is the kind of liberation theology we need to go home with today. Are we willing to see the other as a full, equally human being to me? Whether he or she prays in a church, a synagogue, or a mosque, in a temple, or no pray, or maybe have issues with religion or spirituality, that is for me the challenge that we have to look into. And accordingly, we need to transform the image of the enemy. From being enemy to actually being fellow friend or fellow sister and brother with whom I may have some issues that I need to solve. This brings me to something I said last year in the conference here. When people realize that I do have an accent, have you realized my accent? Uh, you have? No. Oh my God, you, good. You, Father, you are the best. You know why I have an accent? Because I learned English in Texas. <laughs> and they don't speak English there. <laughs> Imam Hindi, where are you from? And I say I'm from dust, dust. Where is that country? Let's Google it. Well, it's not on Google. Is it a new country, Imam? And I remind people of what it says in the Torah, in the Christian Bible, and in the Quran, that we come from Turab to Turab, we shall be returned. We come from dust to dust, we shall be returned. And therefore, my sisters and my brothers, we are fellow Dustonians. <laughs> yes, indeed. You are my fellow Dustonian, and I am your fellow Dustonian. We are equal. We're equal from which we come to which we will be returned. Can we make the bridge equal that will take us from point one to point B? I know I need to finish, but I wish I had the time to go over all of my issues, just maybe reading them and have you reflect on them. Coexistence can be a bridge to peace. Jerusalem is and can become a place of blessing if we understand it, not as a real estate given by God to a specific people, but rather as a city, as a mother that embraces all of its children. And therefore, Jerusalem will continue to be a divisive issue if we do not understand it as a mother who embraces all people. And I think it can embrace all people. At the end of the day, it is the city of peace, meant to be a city of peace. I say security concerns must not be used for justifying violation of human rights of military occupations or attacks on civilians, and religion must not be used as well to justify violation of human rights or attacks on civilians or the other. I also see this is not a religious conflict in any way, shape, and form. However, it is a conflict in which religion has been used to justify one's own agenda against the other. And my last point is my friends, we need to change ourselves by healing old hurts, by self-empathy for our own mistakes, and by growing through self-education. Thank you. Yeah, I'd I like to speak sitting down, but I'm going to stand up because I can't see everybody. And it looks like a beautiful, diverse uh, community, and I, I'll be able to see you better if I stand. So I'm going to stand. It's a pleasure to be back uh, uh, with you. I, I've, I've spoken to this conference before, and I honor your work. This is very, very important work. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It is my Sabbath. I had services this morning uh, that were kind enough to move the program uh, 
because uh, to a, a slightly later time so that the full diversity uh, of the, the family of, uh, we call it Hajar and uh, Sarah and uh, where I come from rather than the family of uh, Abraham, Ibrahim because some people seem to have ignored uh, Hajar and Sarah a little bit too much. So this is the, the uh, Hajarish and uh, Sarahitic uh, family and we're here together as one family. Uh, I don't usually start uh, biographically, but I was just glancing through the program and I saw the, the, uh, the Palestinian olive harvest brochure, um, which brought two things to my mind uh, immediately. My son is in Israel for the year on a program. Um, the second part of his program, he will be working in uh, Israeli-Palestinian towns in the north of Israel, teaching English and working in schools. Uh, and he happened to tell me uh, on the phone a couple of days ago that he participated in an olive harvest on uh, Kibbutz Gezer. Uh, um, has ever, anybody here done uh, our, uh, olive harvesting? Raise your hand. The harvest are not that many. Uh, harvesting olives is about the easiest thing you can do in agriculture, right? All you do is shake and they come down. Um, and uh, I had the, uh, the privilege and responsibility of participating in uh, an olive harvest in Palestine near Nablus a couple of years ago. I say the privilege because I had my, uh, my hands on trees that have been there for centuries and responsibility because I was part of a delegation from Rabbis for Human Rights that was protecting the access of Palestinians to their own land, to their own harvest and making sure uh, that settlers who lived nearby actually lived above in an area called uh, Elon More, uh, were not going to prevent those uh, uh, basically poor folks from access to their own land. So I, I've been in Palestine harvesting uh, olives. I've been uh, with my own hands in the soil of Palestine replanting olive trees that have been um, destroyed or uprooted uh, by settlers and sometimes by the army um, in uh, Haras, near Kifil Haras, where my brother Imam uh, Yahya is from. He's from Kifil Haras. This was in the big town of Haras nearby. So I've had my hands uh, uh, dirty in a beautiful way uh, in, in Palestine as a rabbi, in that case with Rabbis for Human Rights, uh, uh, which is an Israeli organization that is involved in human rights across the board. Human rights are not, they don't stop at any border. Um, they're universal and we need to be involved, all of us need to be involved in the human rights of all peoples. As uh, you heard, I uh, also have the privilege of uh, uh, serving as executive director of Clergy Beyond Borders. Um, Imam Hendi is the president and founder of Clergy Beyond Borders. We're a US-based nonprofit that seeks to empower religious leaders, not just clergy. Clergy is a very limited word. It's an English word that sort of summarizes religious leaders, but some of our traditions, including Islam and Judaism, don't technically have clergy. And we mean men and women, religious leaders of all sorts. Uh, but we empower religious leaders to explore and utilize the resources of their religious traditions to promote authentic dialogue, interreligious understanding, and conflict resolution. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a flavor of, of uh, strategies for conflict resolution, because that is part of uh, the message here, interfaith dialogue as a catalyst for justice and conflict resolution. We, uh, as you see, you can see from the bio and up on the podium, uh, we call ourselves clergy beyond borders, not without borders, because uh, we believe those borders that are between us, that mark, that demarcate these various religions and other God-given religions, um, do not mean that we can't go beyond them. We think God gave those borders for a reason. Of all of our holy texts uh, that I know, the Quran is clear as to why. Uh, because it says, it, it asks the question and answers it. If God wanted to uh, create one religion, one people, then God could have done that, right? So why are we created different religions? We like to say one faith, different religions. 
in order so that you, become, you would come to know each other, which is one reason why you came to this session. Um, so you're fulfilling part of the verse of the Quran. And uh, I, can, I just have a sense for the people in the room and because of uh, the Holy Land Christian Ecumenical Foundation, the other part of that verse is to, in effect, compete with each other to do what is right and good. This morning I read from the, uh, uh, the Torah in the, in, the, in the service, the passage in Genesis, which says that God has singled out Abraham, that is Ibrahim, in order to do what is right and good. La'asot mishpat utzdaka was in the, the reading this morning. That's what we are commanded to do as children of Abraham, Sarah, and Hajar. So um, uh, we are commanded to know each other and to do the right and the just and to, and to do it as strongly as we can in each of our separate religious traditions. Our, uh, the symbol of clergy band borders is the ark, the ark, the ark of Noah and Nama and their family, the biblical ark. Uh, it's saying here, once we share the same boat, can we ride together now? It's one ark. One humanity, we're doing a caravan next week in Maryland, one Maryland, but in this case, uh, for those of you who are Americans, one country and one world. But uh, this ark that we were all in together in the story of Noah and Nama, it's no different from our situation today. We're all on one ark. It's a larger ark, but it's not, uh, it's not infinitesimally large. Uh, it's not, uh, it's not, uh, um, it's not infinite inf uh, with infinity. I mean, we are on an ark. It's called Earth. It's a spaceship. All of us are on that spaceship hurtling through space. All the animals, all the human beings, and if part of humanity is in trouble, then all of humanity is in trouble. If somebody's digging a hole through violence in one part of that ark, that ark, which belongs to all of us, is going to sink. So Clergy Beyond Borders uh, is committed to going beyond the borders, God-given borders. We like to say borders usually go like this. You can take a border and turn it into a table and sit around it like we're doing now and uh, have conversations. And that's part of our mission in Clergy Beyond Borders. Um, we work uh, particularly uh, with clergy, training clergy for uh, the sake of conflict resolution and peace building. As I said, I'm going to just very quickly, uh, if I have time, go over seven uh, peace-building strategies that I think emerge from our religious traditions. But just a bit of the way I see the history, which is, uh, uh, it's important to keep in mind, I, I see Christianity and Judaism, remember I'd say one faith, many religions. So as a religion, Judaism is the oldest. As a faith, we're the same age, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. I mean, it, it was communicated through one family, at least that's our, that's our, uh, our biblical story in our text. One family begins the story which eventually leads to three Western traditions. But Christianity and Judaism as we know it, not ancient Israelite religion, not, not the uh, religion of those who wandered through the desert, but Judaism that's now practiced pretty much emerged together in the first century both as peace-loving and even pacifist religions in a century when they were in conflict with the world, the world dominating empire, the Roman Empire. In response to domination and corruption, other leaders have emerged in history. We think of the prophet Muhammad in the seventh century, also the founder of a religion not the faith, goes back to Abraham, but a religion that was a religion of peace. We still have people like that from the 20th and 21st century, the Dalai Lama, for instance. Uh, uh, but against the vision of these founders and early stages of the religion, we find politicized religion, not faith, politicized Christianity, politicized Islam, fighting each other during the Crusades, for instance. My community, a much tinier community, uh, also has its experience of politicized religion. The Maccabees were such a politicized religious group. So were the zealots in the first century and the inheritors of that tradition, ultra-nationalists who see Jewish self-determination in the land of Israel, in the state of Israel, 
as negating Palestinian rights of self-determination. As you can imagine from my biography, what I've said about uh, my work in Rabbis for Human Rights, I don't believe that the self-determination of Israeli Jews and the self-determination of Palestinian Arabs has to be a zero-sum game. In fact, I don't believe you can be pro-Palestine without being pro-Israel, and I don't believe you can be pro-Israel without being pro-Palestine. All of the world suffers from a plague of the merger of religion and nationalism, which is essentially the definition of totalitarianism and fascism. What are the strategies and elements to confront this plague? And I'll run through seven very quickly. One is from the book of Exodus. A text says, when you see the donkey of your enemy lying under its burden and would refrain from raising it, you must nevertheless raise it with him. So helping your enemy with a burden would change his opinion of you. It's a classic example of unilateral gestures which can cause cognitive dissonance. How can this person be my enemy and be supporting me or supporting my beast of burden? And there's conflict resolution as a shared strategy, humanizes the enemy. That's where this project that I spoke of in, in, uh, originally, helping with the olive harvest for uh, Israeli uh, rabbis helping and other Israeli Jews helping with harvest and uh, home rebuilding. Um, Imam Hendi didn't speak, I, don't th I, I think I heard his whole presentation, but he's brought uh, his students, Muslim students from Georgetown to Tennessee to help build, rebuild a church together with the people of that community. So common work uh, as a conflict resolution strategy. Unilateral uh, gestures of aid and solidarity. Uh, Israelis working in Palestinians, uh, uh, in Palestinian villages, uh, donations for the upkeep of mosques by Christian groups, um, visits of condolences in Israel and Palestine uh, working on uh, both sides, uh, one side for the other, and sadly a version of this, joint mourning. I'm aware uh, and support an organization in um, Israel and Palestine called the Bereaved Family Forum. Parents who have lost children and some have lost siblings to uh, acts of violence on the other side who nevertheless have come together uh, to work for conflict resolution and, and to mourn together. Basic framework of human rights, the International Declaration of Human Rights uh, uh, speaks at the very beginning of the inherent dignity and equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. Peace without this type of justice and human rights is not peace. We say it in religious language that we are created in the image of God, B'Tselem Elohim. Every single individual of every race and every religious tradition is created in the image of God. Uh, finally, well, two left. Promotion of uh, values of peace and nonviolence, which are core values in these traditions that, that we represent today. Um, my work began in 19, uh, directly in the Middle East in 1975 when I traveled on a Jewish Christian uh, peace mission through Cairo, Beirut, Damascus, Amman, over the Allenby Bridge to Palestine and Israel. We met with the PLO leadership in, uh, uh, in Beirut and we uh, uh, suggested to them in 1975 that they ought to uh, get on boats and come back as refugees and we would go with them. So it's 1975. Unfortunately, uh, that strategy of nonviolence uh, wasn't taken up at a time when I think it could have uh, been most effective, uh, but it's still effective. I think the thing that Israel fears the most is the combination of the justice the Palestinian cause in the eyes of God and the world combined with a strategy of nonviolence. That's still a message that can bring us uh, uh, to the other side of this conflict. And finally, uh, in my tradition, we call it teshuva, which means repentance, uh, the closest in English, but it actually means turning around. It's a path to reconciliation, but the end of the path is reconciliation. The parts of the path that get there are confession, expressing what, uh, and verbalizing what you've done wrong, apology, then conciliation, 
which means re reparation, repairing for what the, the injury is, then forgiveness on the other side, and then reconciliation. I think though there are strategies that lead to that in all of our three uh, religious traditions and with many of the other traditions. And uh, I know that I'm, uh, in a sense, preaching to the choir, an organization that has as its title uh, all those wonderful things. Foundation, I don't know about that. Foundation, but Holy, Holy Land, Christian, and Ecumenical all speak to the questions that, uh, and the strategies that I've given. And I think my time is, uh, I'm getting a little signal here, and I hope we have time for a discussion. We do. We Good. do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rabbi, Imam, and Bishop. And uh, I now would like to open the mics uh, on each side for your questions on interreligious dialogue, interfaith dialogue, uh, to all sitting up here at this table. First. Hi, I just want to say I appreciated every, what everybody said. I think there was really great value in, in everything that was expressed. And I, I also really appreciated the Joha joke. I thought that was really <laughs> innovative and, and great. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, I'm somebody who's a product of uh, mixed faith, I would, I guess. I come from a Jewish home and also uh, my father's Palestinian and Muslim. <clears throat> so we have kind of seen in our family uh, religion being kind of uh, divisive, unfortunately. Um, we have found within my own family that, <clears throat> excuse me, the Palestinian side is much more open and if you look at Palestine, they are the model of diversification and assimilation. I mean, we've had people come from all over the world at all different times and blend in very beautiful ways. Sometimes initially it's a shock and it you know, hasn't worked out well at the beginning, but it's a very accommodating society. I think in a way that's part of our, the origin of our problem. We were too accommodating to too many people. Um, I, I guess one of the things that really strikes me as far as what the rabbi was saying, I mean, the, uh, as a Palestinian, uh, when I think about uh, the early Jews and I think about the Christians and the Muslims, the notion that people have converted from path to path, that uh, Muslims have a profound understanding of the Old Testament and the New Testament and, of course, the Quran. My feeling is that um, I, as far as what the rabbi is saying, I, I, I guess uh, how I feel about the, the, the Jewish, um, American Jews in particular, I, we've had a lot of problems on uh, my mother's side of the family. Some very staunch uh, Zionists. The fact that, <clears throat> excuse me, within my own family, Let me move on. Um, what I want to say is I feel like you need to not have interfaith with Christians and Muslims. I think most of us really understand what's going on as far as that goes. I mean, we people like to, to say that Palestinians and Arabs are anti-Semitic. And I really, the, the percentage of people who really feel that way in the Middle East, I think, is, is minuscule. I think people have a profound understanding and deep respect for the Jewish faith and what, what is really at the core of Judaism. And, um, and that really what needs to be done is to, to talk more to Jews themselves. Like instead of helping Palestinians with the, the harvest, go up to the settlement and, and talk to them. And you know, I mean, you're talking about there's nothing greater in the olive harvest. You shake the, the, the olives and they come down and it's, it's easy. Well, a lot of the settlers, they wait till the Palestinians have done, quote unquote, the easy part, and then they grab the bags of olives and do things with them themselves, and they deprive people of their livelihood. And especially here, I'm, I'm kind of curious, I guess here's a question, how things go at your, um, at your own synagogue, how much you talk about what you do with them. I mean, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, also issues as far as I guess this is another topic, but genetics, there was just something in the post recently about how Ashkenazi Jews, uh, genetically speaking, are not tied to the Near East. 
uh, the Sephardic Jews, of course, are a different uh, category, and that goes to the um, what I was saying about people converting from Judaism to Christianity to Islam. Um, I just really feel think work needs to be done with the Jewish community, and particularly the American Jewish community. There was a very good article, and this is where I'll stop, by Peter Beinart um, about um, uh, the Jewish American cocoon, I believe it's called, and it's available online, and it's about how it's impossible to speak to American Jews without having them try to protect themselves um, from, I think, what they realize is uh, core realities that they don't want to face. Thank you. What are you doing in your congregation at Chevy Chase is what she's asked. Go ahead. First of all, I think uh, all of us feel your, hear your pain and feel it uh, deeply. Um, so I want to acknowledge that, uh, the family pain. And, and there's a, enough pain to go around in all the communities that are represented this room, in this room. But there's also a job of healing uh, that has to happen within the communities. Uh, and, uh, um, it's true, most of my work has been in the Jewish community trying to heal, heal the deformation that you speak about the, away from the core value. Uh, but Muslims have to do that within Islam and Christians have to do it within Christianity. There's a whole set of Christians in this country that some people call Christian Zionists who are the most uh, intransigent uh, supporters of whatever the Israeli government wants to do and believe that any giving up any land, uh, uh, Israel giving up land is gonna forestall Jesus returning. Those, though they're Christians. All of us have rejectionist, uh, prejudiced people, people who misunderstand the text, and we need to heal our communities. Uh, you wouldn't hear, in, in my case, you wouldn't hear anything different in my synagogue from what I would say here. I never speak uh, uh, about Palestinians without saying, I would put it like this, my brothers and sisters in Israel are cousins, the Palestinians, um, these, these are all part of the family, um, and we're all part of the family of Sarah and, and Hajar. We have to live together as a family. We're, not, we're just different branches of the same family. Uh, and I say nothing different, but that doesn't mean the issues that Peter Beinart writes about are not true, uh, that, they're, that they're people. Uh, I, I've been fighting this fight, I said, in 1975 is when I, I went to Beirut, uh, before the, the PLO had uh, moved away from a, uh, a strategy that I thought was defeating the Palestinian people. The Palestinian people has to heal itself. It has, it has leaders that move in, in one direction and leaders that move in the other. The American people uh, has, has some pain and suffering that we just uh, experienced here in Washington and uh, more directly than the rest of the country and it's not finished so I, I, uh, I'm not sure if there's anything more I can say ex except to acknowledge that I've been fighting for exactly what you would want to happen in the Jewish community uh, for quite a long time, and we haven't won that battle yet. There are people on the other side. And I don't know if my, my uh, brothers on the panel here want to speak about their own communities, but I know that they struggle within those communities as well. Well, I, I was just thinking that <clears throat> it, for many of us, the way that these, these difficulties become blessings is encounter with real human beings. So, so a lot of theoretical conversation can take place, and that's good and helpful, but in fact it's just meeting up with somebody who's different than you are that makes the personal difference. And I was remembering that the church I served before I was elected bishop, um, there were a number of couples in that church in which one person was Lutheran and the other was Jewish. And it certainly makes a different ha difference how a, a, a person uh, from a Christian perspective talks about the, the Older Testament, for instance, to know that there are people listening, sometimes week after week, who have a different background um, and a different understanding. And the, the best voice in the choir in that church was a Turkish Muslim woman 
who was there because she was a graduate student at the University of Maryland. She was dating a boy who also sang in the choir. And, and, and what a person says about other people's religion is different when you are in the presence of people who practice that religion. If, if communities of, of faith were open enough to be inviting, even occasionally, to people who were not born members of those communities, I think that would make a big difference for all of us. That, that, that's just what I was thinking while you were speaking, Rabbi. For the sake of time, I only say one thing. We must not allow the bitterness of yesterday paralyze the possibilities of tomorrow. My friends, there's so much hope in that beautiful piece of land. I see it. I swear by God, I see it. I swear by God, I see it. Every time I go to Bethlehem, I see it. I go to Nazareth, and I see it. I go to Jerusalem and I see it. We can keep talking about the past as long as we want. But I say, let us learn from yesterday to paint a new chapter in tomorrow. To do this, we need to open our hearts. I think the uh, HCF program of Living Stones is a wonderful venture to make that happen as we meet people. Uh, sure, we see the, the stones, but we also see the Living Stones. And check our website for uh, those, those pilgrimages. Advertise to your friends those pilgrimages to go to the Holy Land and meet the people. To be with the people is to touch uh, God in a very special way and resolve some of the uh, misunderstanding that we can do as ambassadors for peace. Next question, please. Thank you all. As a participant in today's conference from Boston, I just want to elaborate a little bit about interfaith up there and what happened six months ago at the marathon. It's true that we don't talk to each other as much as we should, but after the bombings happened, there was a very beautiful interfaith service that took place, hosted in the Catholic Cathedral where a lot of different faith communities came together. And those two guys who, as their uncle from Maryland, aptly described as losers, and I hear that word also in the Quranic sense where the Quran talks about the ones who will be accounted among the losers. We should say publicly they were not remotely in the mainstream of their own mosque, which they only attended occasionally, by the way. So there are some initiatives that are ongoing. We have a lot more to do. And also, as the imam pointed out, I think it's when we talk about interfaith today in North America, we do need to include those who may have no horizon of faith whatsoever, or they're alienated from their faith tradition for whatever reason. And I'll just conclude with a quote from Benjamin Franklin who said, we must all hang together or assuredly we will all hang separately. Yeah, true enough. And, and I, would, I suppose I would publicly <laughs> apologize to, um, first of all, the Red Sox fans here, but then, but then to anybody else. I, I had much of my education in Boston and I love Boston. Um, I, I would say, just to, to, to follow what you said, sir, that um, one of the things that, that happens in our country, which may not be exactly a religious thing, but which religious people need to respond to, is that there are lots and lots of people who feel lost in, in our culture. And um, the, 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 the political process does not lend itself to uh, encouraging any of us to look out for any of the rest of us. But that's, that's a, that, that also, as I understand what happened in, in, in lots of parts of our country, is a burden of our time. So, so it's not just Boston. I should not have expressed myself quite that way. But, uh, but some attention to those people so that, uh, so that the losers, um, so to speak, aren't just uh, allowed to, uh, to drift away from the rest of us. Next question, please. 
Um, to the rabbi, you made a statement about being pro-Palestinian and pro-Israeli and the two things being the same. Um, in my mind, I've always drawn a distinction between the people and the state, and I feel like that statement conflates those two, which actually, for me, makes it very difficult to reconcile the two. Um, I've always said there's the Jewish people, the Israeli people, and then there's this racist state called Israel. Um, for me to combine those two things and then to also say that being pro-Israeli is also pro-Palestinian um, is problematic. I'm wondering if you can elaborate on what you meant with that and hopefully shed some light. Do you want to answer that? Yeah. Okay, because so I'd like to, you, could, you have a good uh, take on that. Um, the, I'm not a big fan of nationalism. It's a plague and when combined with religion, as I say, it's, it's fascism. Uh, there's, there may have been other so, uh, solutions to the problem of uh, uh, Jewish nationalism and Palestinian nationalism than the, than the solutions that are in front of us right now. Um, but the Jewish people predates the Jewish religion. It is a people, it has a national identity, if I'd have been alive in the 1930s and 40s, I would have been uh, with Martin Buber and uh, Judah Magnus, who were in favor of a binational state that recognized the Jewish national identity and a Palestinian national identity. Um, that solution, which was a, a viable solution in the 30s and 40s, is not with us right now. There's a, um, something that would recognize Jewish nationalism and Palestinian nationalism is, is the solution that one needs. And at the moment, pragmatically, that means two states. That isn't a, uh, that's not a, an ideal solution or even an ethical solution. It's the most viable solution. So when I, well, I use it in a very, I didn't try to make an equivalence. I just said to support Palestinian nationalism, self-determination, uh, self at this point in history, one has to support Jewish self-determination, which in the present, sta present form is in the state of Israel. Uh, who knows what it'll be 100 years from now, whether the two nations will share that territory, but that, so I, I, I say it in a very limited, uh, pragmatic context, not in any kind of ideal context. Um, it, it, as uh, 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 the first speaker, I think, said, uh, Palestinian, uh, for the Palestinians to, uh, to emerge as a national group with self-respect in the world and a diverse group and not be subsumed in a different conflict that's going on within Islam, to be a Christian, uh, Muslim country which also allows Jewish uh, citizens of the Palestinian national state, I think pragmatically, at this point in history, one ought one needs to support both people's self-determination. That, that's the clearest way I can express it. There is a Jewish national people, uh, or nas a Jewish nation. Um, its state, which exists already and is called Israel, should be a full democracy and not a, a racialist democracy. I'll put it that way. I don't think it's racist, but it's racialist. Its preference gives preference in all kinds of ways to, to Jewish uh, to Jews, including especially in immigration. But by definition, it's not racist. There are, uh, within Israel, what's in the occupied territories, a different uh, set of issues. But that's what I meant. The two self-determinations have to be respected. And, and I explained what I think pragmatically that means just, just in today's world. Thank you, Reverend. We have time only for one more question. Do you have something you want to okay, say? Maybe I'll, I'll answer in different ways. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna take it a little bit out of political context, and um, I'm kind of curious if you guys could talk about, we know that um, interfaith communication is really important, but how do you guys feel about interfaith marriages in the community? Ah. Well, I like that question for me. Uh, when I came to Georgetown University 14 years ago, I did Muslim-Muslim marriages and quite a few of them. And in 2002, I did my first 
Presbyterian Muslim marriage, and it went well. I was one with, I was uh, one of two people who officiated the marriage, an imam and a Christian minister. Then a year after that, I did a Catholic Muslim marriage with me and a priest. And in 2004, I did five marriages where I was the only officiant in, Catholic, in Christian Muslim marriages where Christians felt comfortable enough with me to officiate a Muslim Christian marriage. Recently, I did Jewish Muslim marriages that seem to be on the rise in America. So my friends, it is at least Muslim, Jewish, Muslim, Christian is on the rise. I think Christian, Jewish has been happening in America in, in so many ways, shapes and forms. And I understand from my own scholarship that most Jews would not feel comfortable with interfaith marriages as such. Most rabbis would not do it, but there are rabbis who do perform Jewish, Muslim, or Jewish, Christian marriages. I am an absolute supporter of interreligious marriages or interfaith marriages, meaning Muslims marrying Christians and Jews and Jews and Christians marrying Muslims. And you know, in the Muslim community, there is the understanding, and this will shock each and every one of you, that to marry, for, it is okay for a Muslim man to marry a Christian woman, but it is not okay for a Muslim woman to marry a Christian or a Jewish man. I broke out of that tradition in 2007 to perform the first marriage in America that I know of, performed by an imam officially in a mosque, where I married a Muslim woman to a Catholic man. And I am now known to be the interfaith marriage, the imam who married Muslim women to Jews and Christians. <laughs> because I believe that love has no borders and no boundaries, and a religion that divides is not a religion I want to follow. Thank you. I'd like to thank our three uh, speakers today for their witness of faith to us all and their commitment to uh, religious understanding and their support of our people, holy people in the Middle East and the Holy Land. Okay. Thank you, Penel, very, very much. I just want, before we end, I want to quote, give you a few quotations from different biblical traditions. It will take me two seconds, and then I have uh, an announcement, and then we'll move ahead with the program. From Isaiah, it says, Come now, let us reason together. From Rabbi Hillel, If I am not for myself, who will be for me? But if I am only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? From Matthew, it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. From the Quran, Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching, and argue with them in ways that are best and most gracious. For thy Lord knowest best, who have strayed from his path and who receive guidance. From Jalal din Rumi, beyond our ideas of right doing and wrongdoing, there is a field. I will meet you there. And last but not least, from Maya Angelou, who wrote in her beautiful poem at the inauguration of President Clinton, history, despite its wrenching pain cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. Thank you very much, and thank you, panel, again.